Welcome to the latest edition of the Goals-Based Investing podcast series. I'm thrilled today to be joined by my good friend and mentor, Gary Bridgman. Gary, come forward. But maybe as I start, uh, Gary, you and I have served on the board of IMCA for many, many years. You were the president. Uh, and I've always been struck by the professionalism, the class and the dignity that you've carried yourself with and how you've led that organization. Um, but I'm, I'm also very much aware that your journey was not a typical sort of journey. Uh, and I think it might help some of the folks who are listening to the podcast to just hear what your journey was like, in particular, kind of the early days uh, starting out in the industry and some of the challenges and uh, the things that you face that many of us really haven't been exposed to. Would, would you mind sharing that with us? Tony, I guess you're right. It was somewhat of a fortuitous uh, uh, um journey that I had. I actually started my career in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, of all places, uh, after having grown up in Indiana, Indiana and gone to Indiana University. Um, after graduating, I ended up in Jackson, and Merrill Lynch made an offer to me at 23 years of age. Uh, but they wanted me to work for a few years and, uh, at some corporation and then come back. So after two years, I uh, went to work for Merrill Lynch and I became the state's first African-American uh, registered representative. Uh, as I was training in uh, New York, we had a six week training program back in those days. Uh, they didn't really want me to go back to Mississippi. They thought it was absolutely the worst place in the world for me. And then to find out that I went back to Mississippi and became one of their top producers, uh, certainly the top producer African-American in the country uh, brought a lot of uh, kind of uh, attention to me as to uh, people trying to figure out uh, well, how could something like that happen. As you know, Mississippi is the poorest state in the United States. And socially, going back to the late 70s, early 80s, it wasn't perhaps the best social climate for an African-American. Nevertheless, uh, I saw a community there that was trying to shed its past and was looking forward to his future. And I used that as an opportunity for me to kind of build a business. I kind of knew then it didn't take the whole state to have some success. It only took a certain number of enlightened people who wanted someone who could really work hard for them. And I was able to, uh, to carve out a really successful career for myself there. Were there any unique challenges of being a young African-American in Mississippi? And we think of the, the rural South as being particularly challenging in the 70s and 80s. Um, I would say yes to that question. Certainly, yes. There were persons who didn't know I was an African-American. Much of the business was done back in those days over the telephone. You weren't meeting necessarily with people face to face. And when someone actually did come into the office and realize who I was, I did lose some clients uh, and that was a little bit uh, heartbreaking uh, at the time because you're still trying to build a business. Um, but at the same time, I found people that were open-minded, enlightened, and uh, they wanted to do business with me. The, uh, I always knew the external part, meaning uh, having to find clients was gonna be challenging, but it was also kind of challenging working inside the organization you find a lot of little stumbling blocks for you inside these major organizations that makes it uh, and sometimes even more difficult than the external issues that uh, you would be confronted with. Wow. Yeah, something uh, something I can't appreciate, but I, again, it's just kind of stunning in, in today's day and age when we think about that. Um, you obviously became very successful and, and you went on and you provided a lot of great leadership to Merrill Lynch, where, where I think you were involved in sharing their diversity and leadership efforts, and also uh, the, the great work that you did with the Investment and Wealth Institute, the former IMCA organization. You and I probably fall back and use IMCA because we're more comfortable with it, but talk a little bit about leadership and talk about may, maybe why you thought it was important to share your story and, and try to elevate the profession more broadly. Well, at Merrill Lynch, uh, it was the diverse African Americans, uh, diverse African Americans, and and everyone else, the diverse employees, that actually uh, uh, had an outcry uh, to senior management uh, in terms of uh, trying to do more from a diversity standpoint, and uh, that led to 
senior management's forming a diversity council inside of the organization. And then it was important for me to get senior management all on the same page in terms of how they discussed the issue. Uh, it was pretty interesting, the kind of things you would hear uh, at that point in time from senior management about diversity. And we worked to get everyone lined up on the same page around how they viewed the issue. And it ended up being an economic issue. We got them to view diversity from an economic standpoint, which made it a lot more interesting. When you think about uh, the way the world is moving, diverse persons are having more wealth, are uh, receiving more wealth. And for these firms to be positioned in a way in which they didn't have enough uh, diverse employees didn't make a lot of sense to them. So it was that kind of consciousness that kind of brought forth the change uh, in an organization like um, Merrill Lynch. So it was really more of uh, the feel, uh, feeling this, uh, a sense of isolation. There were many diverse persons that were the only diverse person in their office, and they were speaking about that. Uh, there was a revolving door. Uh, as diverse people were coming in, they didn't stay very long. And what you've seen over time is that the industry, at least the major firms, have created and designed programs around helping to increase the likelihood that a diverse candidate would have success. So I think our, our work in the beginning kind of helped to get us to a place where uh, persons are being hired in, in larger numbers and the likelihood that they will have success has increased uh, immensely over the time that I've, I've noticed. And I was at Morgan at the time, and, and Morgan had similar initiatives. And I know RBC and Raymond James and other firms that have these initiatives. It doesn't seem like we've moved the needle enough, though, right? We, we've been talking about it and going back to when you and I were on the board, and I know you certainly championed the cause. We haven't moved the needle as much as I certainly would have hoped, and I suspect you as well. Why is that? Is, is it because we don't have enough role models that people can aspire to say, I want to be like Gary, or I want to be like Betsy, or, or is it something more fundamental? Well, I think when you look in the independent channel, you see a lot more diversity. And we might be missing something because a lot of diverse persons are not necessarily opting for major brokerage firms. Uh, they're creating their own businesses. And I, I find that uh, uh, quite mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, Tony, if you go back and look in the the 60s, uh, diverse persons first got into the insurance industry. That's where you first saw success coming from the insurance business. And then that bled into financial services. You go in the 70s, in the mid 70s, Merrill Lynch had entered a consent decree that it would hire more diverse persons in the mid 70s, right? And then you get to 2013, there was another lawsuit. So from the mid 70s to 2013, um, we were still basically uh, fighting the same issues. Uh, but I, I really think the way to, to uh, have the success that you're looking for is through the promotion of diverse persons in the ranks to management levels and low branch office management and higher. And as you do that, and you see it at Morgan, uh, you see it to some extent at the other firms, maybe not as, as uh, enough, but as you see more of that happening, I think that issue starts to, to naturally uh, resolve itself. Uh, but it is a very difficult business, right? And uh, firms have to be willing to do things to make sure that they, again, as I mentioned earlier, that they increase the likelihood that these candidates are gonna have success and not just ruin their life by coming into that industry and spending years and, and not really having a successful outcome. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that you mentioned there is so critical is we want them to be successful. So rather than just focus on a quota of we're going to hire X amount of people, how do we ensure their success? And, well, and so it used to be that in December of every year, managers hired diverse candidates. It was because they had a goal for the year that they needed to have so many. And that was part of the failure. Uh, you, at, in December, you're hiring basically whoever knocked on the door. You're not doing too much work in, in terms of selecting these candidates. Uh, so that was a problem that I think the firm started recognizing and uh, they did more to make sure uh, that uh, 
those programs around these people, uh, diverse people, uh, are, are stronger to, to help them with their success. So how do we help get more diverse candidates, African-Americans, women's, uh, Latinos, Asians? How, how do we help get more diverse candidates into leadership roles? Is it something as simple as having more mentors or having somebody who looks like you or traveled a similar journey? It is, I'm sure there's no silver bullet on it, but, but again, I think what are the baby steps that we can take to kind of change the de demographics over time? Well, you know, good managers don't necessarily have to be good producers, right? So there's, um, um, I think uh, it may be in certain ways easier to find management candidates than it is to find those persons that are going to be successful uh, producers. Uh, but I, I think they just have to send out a call uh, and make sure everyone knows that the doors are open for that to occur. Because most people are thinking about, you know, being a successful financial advisor. They're really not thinking about necessarily uh, management as much. But I think managers, uh, and I, I in earnest believe at the top of these organizations, Tony, and for purpose of this conversation, you and I are focusing on, I guess, the number top four or so, uh, of the uh, brokers firms, the Merrill, the Morgans, the UBS, and, and Wells, uh, I think they're all committed. I really, in earnest, see things that says that from the top, these organizations are committed to making the right things happen. Uh, so it's a matter of just allowing it to kind of work its way through the system. And uh, but I'm seeing, I, I think I'm seeing positive signs uh, that, that that they are committed and 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 things will perhaps. Uh, uh, increase each year as we go forward. That's my hope. Yeah, and and it's always good to hear your positive perspective. I, I I think you're you're very humble and modest, but the reality is to see more successful advisors like you on stage at conferences or assuming leadership roles in organizations like Inca or demonstrating leadership at at Merrill when you were there and then Morgan later in your career. I think that has to be a really big impetus for advisors who say, I see somebody like me. I see somebody who's traveled a similar sort of journey. And I know if I put in the time and the effort, I, I can get there. Uh, Tony, excuse me, there's two things. One is external, finding new clients. The other is internal. And, and you heard me say earlier, there's a struggle in both instances. And I think what the firms have to do is be very concerned about the issues that are internal, right? And making sure that they're doing blocking and tackling to make sure those issues go away. And they've got to design programs that help people to attract more clients. And I hate to make it overly simplistic, but to me, that's what needs to, needs to occur in order to reach the goal that you have in mind of seeing more successful persons. Yeah. Well, Gary, you, you have certainly been an inspiration to me and to so many uh, in the industry. And, and I think you've had a much broader impact than probably you even realize just the way that you have carried yourself, the way you've conducted yourself, the leadership that you've demonstrated. I've certainly been uh, privy to it. You have retired, and, and you and I have kind of joked about what does retirement really mean. You're not fully retired. You're still engaged. But what are the things that you're doing now that get you excited? How are you engaged in your retirement years? And you shared a little bit about your philosophy about where and how you spend time if you think you can really make a difference. What won't you share with the, the group here? Yeah, I, right now, my, my thinking or philosophy about getting involved is if, it, if I think someone else can do it, then I'll let them do it. And if I think it's kind of somewhat unique to me and my skill set and my background, then I'm happy to add my shoulder to the effort. And that has meant that there's fewer things that I'm doing these days. Uh, I am on advisory board to uh, Columbia. Columbia University has a wealth management program, uh, a master's level wealth management program. I'm happy to kind of watch those students. It's kind of really exciting to watch those persons come into this industry. I'm helping some uh, Catholic nuns uh, that I'm really excited about. Uh, they're activist investors that kind of go back to the days when they were uh, demonstrating against uh, investments in South Africa. And they've taken that uh, ESG concept that we refer to today. They were involved in what would have been ESG years and years ago. And they actually are 
are very, very much involved in uh, shareholder resolutions and making, forcing corporations to do uh, the right thing. So it's been really, really fun uh, watching this group of highly professional, uh, very serious minded uh, ladies uh, kind of make the world better. As always, it's great to spend time with you. Great to hear your perspective. Great to hear your positive outlook and, and the sense that maybe we're moving in the right direction here. Uh, I suspect you'll never fully retire like I'll probably never fully retire because we care so much about this industry and we care so much about giving back. Before you go, let me thank you and let me also congratulate you for all that you've done and also your new book, Go Based Investing. I don't want to do a commercial for you, but I just want to make sure everyone knows you have contributed a great deal to this industry and I'm so happy to be able to call you a friend. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you, Tony.